Welcome to the Seller Roundtable e-commerce coaching and business strategies with Andy Arnott and Amy Wees. Okay, so number five on my list is that we found that Indian suppliers are very eager to do business with Amazon sellers. So they're very excited about this. Um, because this is a new and emerging buyer segment for Indian suppliers, and um, a lot of them are now actually adapting and um, catering to the needs of Amazon sellers. For example, there are more and more suppliers that are offering door-to-door -door delivery. That's something that they were not doing previously. Um, they are, um, you know, previously it was just like, okay, I'm a supplier. My job is to make the product and then you can manage the shipping and logistics on your own. And that's not my headache. But for Amazon sellers, they're kind of changing that. Um, so that's one thing that we noticed. And then there are other things like, um, you know, when we were at the fair, we actually did a presentation to about 50 exhibitors from the show. This is something that the show organizers had requested us to do because we were a large group of Amazon sellers and this is a new you know, buyer segment for them. So we talked to them about uh, the needs of Amazon sellers and, and what we, what, how they can help us you know, source better products. And of course, they were interested in selling on Amazon themselves <laughs> because they see it as an opportunity, right? I mean, similar to Chinese suppliers. Um, mm -hmm. So, but a lot of them are currently not selling directly on Amazon. So, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if increasingly more suppliers do start selling on Amazon directly. So this is something that you just need to be aware of. And in fact, Amazon themselves are encouraging manufacturers to sell directly on Amazon. Yeah. I didn't meet anyone from Amazon at the show, but someone was telling me later that there were Amazon rep representatives at the show and they were talking to exhibitors and they were telling them, explaining to them how to sell directly on Amazon. Yeah, and we saw that in China too, that um, yeah. the actual Amazon reps coming out there and explaining how to get manufacturers to sell direct. And it makes yeah. sense because, you know, Amazon is trying to help the prices come down and, and all of that. Um, and I've, I, you know, I've been receiving more messages lately from um, manufacturers in India saying like, you know, do you, you know, can you help me with the Amazon stuff? And just in some of my groups mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, so that's really been interesting. And, um, you know, so I think it's, uh, it's something that, like you said, it's something to be aware of. I think it's something, you know, as well that um, the Western sellers will usually always have a leg up because True. they know the market, they can connect with the customer a little bit better than someone who is not aware of the culture and the market. Just like we Americans, if we go over to India and we try to start selling something in India, we have some things to learn, you know, if we try to list some exactly. stuff in Europe, you know, uh, we had uh, Jenna Krakik on our um, show the other day and she was talking about uh, listing optimization for European countries. And she said, you can't, if you write a listing for Germany, you don't want to put out there like that your product is the best thing since sliced bread because the Germans will see that as they like to decide themselves and they won't buy your product right. if you brag about it. So that's the thing is it's, it's important to be aware as Megla mentioned, but it's also important to remember that you do have strength in your own market and, uh, and, you know, if, if you know how to sell to your own market, you can sell ice to an Eskimo <laughs> <laughs> successfully. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons it's also very important to build your own brand and have a name for yourself and, you know, um, build an audience and, you know, have your Facebook group and an email list because that's something that people can't really take away from you, you know. Yes. Um, Okay, let's see what else. So, um, right, number six on my list is uh, negotiation. So this is something that um, one of the speakers mentioned. We had one session on negotiation, you know, how to negotiate with the Indian suppliers. And one of the things that really stood out for me was that the speaker said, everything is negotiable. So it's, it's not that, you know, you can't negotiate on delivery time or um, you know, price is not the only thing that can be negotiated. Everything can be negotiated. So that's something to, you know, keep in mind when you're sourcing from India. 
And he also mentioned that there are no rules for negotiation. <laughs> so it's just, you know, they just, uh, you just play it by ear and you see how the relationship is going. And the suppliers also, they, uh, they will work with you depending on how much they trust you, how much they like you, how confident they are in your uh, ability to place repeat orders. And, you know, if they're confident that, yes, you're, you're a professional, you're, you're kind of selling your product well, and you'll be able to place more repeat orders and grow, they are more willing to work with you, of course. So that's something that, you know, um, um, stood out for me, negotiation. And that's true in China as well, to some extent. Um, you know, everything is negotiable, especially as you're scaling and you've developed a relationship, but it's even more important in India. That's really good to know. And another mm. reason why, if you're going to go to India, that you should go with Megla. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, those things, you know, <laughs> negotiation, as you know, uh, we really focus on that in, in yeah. uh, the China trip because the thing is, it's a game changer for your business. It if you is, understand yeah. how to negotiate and you really, you understand how the cultural negotiation works there, wherever you're sourcing from, that's the difference between sometimes tens of thousands of dollars for one order. So it's really important. And what, what is, what does that mean for your business? If you can save $20,000 on one order and you're just starting sourcing from India, well, wow, yeah. what will that do for your business? What will that do for your profitability? So really important that, that uh, the India sourcing trip is addressing that. And, um, and it's so important for every business to address that uh, before thinking about sourcing from any country. So that's wonderful. Absolutely. And then there was this one instant where one of the attendees was, um, she went to an exhibitor and you know he quoted her a price and she thought it was a bit high. And then she went back to the exhibitor the, the next day with one of the coaches. So um, this lady is a sourcing agent. And, uh, you know, she said, hey, I think this price is too high. Can you come with me and talk to the exhibitor? And, um, you know, she, she went to the exhibitor with the coach. And they were able to negotiate the price uh, down by 30%. Nice. Now, 30%. That's huge. huge. So I think... When you're there in person, it's easier to negotiate the price, you know, rather than doing it um, online over by email or on the phone. Um, okay, number seven. So India is very culturally different from the U.S. in terms of how they do business. There are, there are a lot of similarities with China, I would say. For example, uh, the concept of saving face is prevalent in India too. So that's something that you need to be aware of, you know. They don't call it guanxi as such, but they call it, there's no easy way to say it in English, but I'm just going to literally translate. They, they say, you cut my nose. <laughs> so, you know, that's like you dis disrespected me. <laughs> okay. So, um, whereas in China, you know, they say saving face. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really important to be aware of all of these cultural nuances and cultural differences. And this is something that we stress a lot, uh, you know, during the trip, we have uh, sessions talking about this. And uh, I'll give you one example um, of a cultural difference. So sometimes Indians are not very good at punctuality and, um, you know, keeping deadlines and, um, you know, keeping appointment times, for example. I don't know, it's just this culture. Um, sometimes they call it Indian stretchable time instead of Indian standard time, <laughs> but it's just the culture. So you just need to be aware of this and there are, you know, certain ways to, uh, to deal with this. So for example, if you're scheduling an appointment with someone, you ask them, are you sure it's going to be one o'clock? And you know, the, the word to use is pakka. So pakka means, are you sure in Hindi? So, um, you know, it's called the rule of pakka. <laughs> so that's how you talk to them, you know, when you're scheduling an appointment. Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? Then they'll be like, uh, okay, make it 1.30, you know, maybe not one. Let's make it 1.30. <laughs> right. So there are these little things that you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with suppliers. And that's, some, that's something that we really teach during the trip as well. Um, okay, number eight on my list is um, how labor intensive most of the products are. I think we... Um, that's, that's something that stood out for attendees. We visited a factory that was making leather products. And um, most of the sewing machines over there were very 
you know, basic kind of sewing machines, uh, not a lot of, um, you know, not the electronic kind of sewing machines like you would find in China. Um, whereas, you know, in China, I remember visiting a factory way back when, and they had um, these semi-automated sewing machines with LCD screens and, you know, all of that stuff. But in India, there were more basic sewing machines. And one of the reasons for that is labor costs are still low in India, whereas in China, labor costs are increasing. So suppliers are investing more in automation. However, we did see some suppliers investing more in automation. For example, the leather factory, they actually had this computerized embroidery machine at the back of the factory that was, in fact, imported from China. <laughs> <laughs> so do you spend some time actually going and doing some factory visits as well? Yes, yes. So we take people to one factory and um, we actually went to two factories. So we split into two groups. We did two different factories. So one was a leather factory and one was a home decor factory. And then people could choose which one they wanted to go to. And then we had two buses going to two different factories at the same time. Um, and we spent some time there. So yeah, I think that's something that stood out for people, how labor intensive the processes are, but they are investing more in automation. In fact, there was this one supplier that I was talking to recently, a couple of days ago, and she was telling me that they are expanding their factory and they are investing more in laser cutting machines for metal products. And these machines are again being imported from China. But yeah, I think gradually they're investing a bit more in automation, but by and large, it's still very labor intensive. Wow. All right. Well, that's good to know. And that's sometimes why the lead times are a little bit longer, right? Yes. And, you know, you will still find factories in China that have very old machines and very old processes. Um, right. And so, you know, it's it's kind of, it's normal to expect that you'll see kind of some factories that are, as they grow, they're going to need to automate yeah. more. So it's good to know. And this is mostly for the handmade kind of products, right? I mean, for things like textiles and, um, um, you know, like t-shirts and all of those kinds of products that are manufactured at scale. There are, of course, a lot of big factories that have, you know, automated machines doing all of those things. But these are more for the handcrafted home decor kind of products that were at the show. Um, okay, so number nine on my list is, um, I think we realize that you really have to go there to the exhibition to see all of these products, to be able to get a sense of the, the variety of products that are on offer, and to be able to see all of the newest products on offer, because suppliers do not post these products on their websites. They just don't. Um, if you have a specific product in mind and, or if you have your own design, it's easy to find a supplier to make that product for you. And it's easy to do that online. But if you're just, if you just want to, um, you know, look for new products to source from India, you have to go there. It's not possible to do that online. It's, it's very difficult. Um, and so, so I think that's, yeah. That being said, do you recommend that, um, that your participants have some ideas of some products that they might like to source before they go just so that they I don't know can can focus on certain things or do you say just kind of you know go and kind of get ideas when you get there I think it's a bit of both so even if you do have some ideas um, for the product category that you're gonna um, source it's also good to keep an open mind and yeah. just browse through, you know, the, the stalls and see if you find something interesting. Um, but yeah, I think some attendees did have some specific uh, products that they had in mind and, you know, they took uh, drawings to the suppliers and they said, okay, this is what we want. Some attendees also did factory tours and they exactly knew what products they wanted. They spoke to, you know, sourcing agents before the trip, scheduled factory tours and they went on their own to talk to the suppliers and they've actually finalized orders while they were there. So I think it really depends on where you are at your business and yeah. if you have a product in mind or not. 
I know at um, at the Canton Fair, it's helpful sometimes to have at least a niche in mind because right. you know you're you tend to see more opportunities when you're focused on a specific niche versus like right. just walking through and it's just so huge, you know. Yeah. And you're like, I don't really, you know. But if you're really focused on a niche, like you're focused on pets or you're focused on camping or something, then you tend to like see products you might not have seen. Uh, you know, if you had, if you were just like looking for everything at once, so that's kind of helpful. Yeah. But in terms of size, you know, the Canton Fair is so big. How is this, um, this gift fair that's in India? What's the, give us an idea of the size and what yeah. um, kinds of categories of products you'll see there. Right. So it's not as big as Canton Fair. Uh, there are about 4,000 exhibitors, uh, but it's, so it's still sizable. It's, it's still quite big and you need about three days to you know cover the fair um completely in fact some people thought that three days was not enough they wanted to go back on the fourth day um it is a five-day fair just so that people know um and so it's very uh, it's very professionally organized you know similar to canton fair they have um, um you know buses from the hotels to the venue um and um, um, the, in terms of categories, there are uh, the biggest category is home decor. So there are a lot of metal products and wooden products um, for you know home use products. Um, fashion accessories is a big category as well. So you find a lot of jewelry, uh, bags, gloves, hats, scarves, shawls, those kinds of things. And um, then. Furnishings is a big category as well. So there are a lot of cushion covers, carpets, rugs, um, doormats. Furniture is a huge category. There's one big pavilion for furniture. And um, there are big pieces of furniture, like huge dining tables and sofas and chairs that you would probably not do. But there are also smaller furniture items like stools and um, you know, flat pack furniture, for example, that's something that you could consider as an Amazon seller. Um, there are also things like, um, you know, small side tables, for example. Uh, wall decor was a big category. We saw a lot of mirrors and paintings and macrame wall decor. Eco-friendly products, of course, that's a category too. Uh, there were some toys, like wooden toys, uh, not not the typical kind of toys that you would see in China, like the battery operated, um, you know, plastic kind of toys, but they're more of wooden toys. We saw a lot of high end gaming sets, for example, chess or, um, you know, uh, checkers and, and really high quality, high end um, board games. That was that's a big category, too. And then there are things like, uh, you know, globes and nautical instruments <laughs> stuff like that um let's see what else leather leather was a big category at the fair too so again jackets um there are a lot of equestrian products that supply that india manufactures uh, in, uh, for uh, in leather but we didn't see a lot of equestrian suppliers there at the fair um yeah and there were some apparel suppliers too not too many most of the apparel manufacturers are the knitted apparel manufacturers are in South India. So at this fair, you'll mostly find suppliers from North India. Um, and North India mostly has uh, woven garments, like the woven, uh, cotton woven garments. Very cool. It's good, good to get an idea yeah. of the fair and the sizing and the different things that you might see there. Do you have yeah. one more takeaway for us? Yes. So the last takeaway for, um, for everyone was that Amazon India is a huge opportunity. It is absolutely huge um, and is growing at a very fast rate. So if you are a global seller, if you're already selling on Amazon US, Australia, Europe, wherever, if you have your own product, your own brand, you should definitely consider selling on Amazon India. Um, just to give you an example or an idea of the scale, um, one of the most important festivals in India is called Diwali. And that's usually in October or November. And um, this year, in, there was this one week festival that was held um, in, in India. It's called the Great Indian Sale, where all of the um, you know, online marketplaces, they basically have a lot of sales and all. It's something like Black Friday, you could say. 
And um, the total volume of sales that was done during that, I think it's a six week, a six day um, sale was about $3 billion. And that's pretty sizable, right? And there are two main marketplaces in India. One is Amazon and one is Flipkart. Flipkart, in fact, is owned by Walmart. So it's basically these two giants, Amazon and Walmart, that are fighting out in India. And they currently um, have about 90% of the market share uh, you know, for online sales. So Flipkart has about 60% and Amazon about 30%. So this is a huge opportunity for uh, overseas sellers. However, it's not easy to sell on Amazon India if you're, if you're an outsider or a foreigner. You need to have your own company set up in India in order to set up an Amazon account. And setting up your own company in India is not a very straightforward process. There are a lot of loopholes and I mean, there are a lot of hoops that you have to um, you know, run through and there are a lot of um, regulations and processes and it's a complicated process. Um, it can take about two to three months to set up a company. And, um, but once you get through all of that, there is huge opportunity. The market is of course a bit different because it's price sensitive. So you have to keep in, keep that in mind. Um, however, there is demand for uh, niche high end kind of products as well. You know, imported products, for example, especially in areas like cosmetics or, you know, skincare products. There is a lot of demand for high-end cosmetics imported from, say, Australia or the U.S. So that's something to consider as well. If you are into cosmetics and if you do have your own brand, then definitely consider selling on India. Um, if anyone is interested in setting up an account, I do know someone who helps with uh, setting up a company in, in India in order to sell on Amazon. So, you know, um, they could reach out to me and I can give them the contact details of this company. Okay, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I can see where some higher end niches might be very popular. During my MBA program, um, we wrote an expansion plan for Toyota. <laughs> and um, that was one of the countries that we considered and international expansion was India. And I've learned a lot about how um, really, you know, there's a lot of street markets. There's a lot of, um, so for commodity products, you're going to be more price sensitive because right. they can get those things in the street markets. They can get those things, you know. And, and that, that type of buyer is going to be really, you know, they're, they're going to be used to the prices that they can already conveniently get those things for. But if you are a, if you have something higher end and you've built a brand for yourself and you are a Western brand, you can do quite well all over, you know, in China, in Japan, yes. and in, you know, and those things are in super high demand. Um, and, you know, Apple is an example. They do very well in India, um, despite the fact that Apple is, you know, very expensive devices and computers. Um, their India sales, despite the market overall, if you study the market, it's you know, very low um, as far as like price point and what people are buying. But Apple is... Yeah. Apple's killing it in India. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's something to, it's really great that you, you have that for them to consider. And so those, and that you gave those wonderful examples of um, people that might find a really nice advantage. And, you know, in, in the U S market on Amazon, some people that are selling the higher end stuff are really struggling right now. They're, they're really mm. struggling to, you know, because there are so many, so many competitors that are kind of driving the prices down of even the higher end looking things. Um, so that's a really great opportunity for people to pivot and uh, maybe be able to get the margins that they're looking for. So awesome. So Meg, like you are running a special early bird price for your trip. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us when we have to take advantage of that. Yes. So the early bird price is until January 31st. So if you sign up before January 31st, you can save $500 on the trip. So yeah, I've got about a month and a half. Um, and there are two options available if you want to sign up for the trip. Um, so first of all, this is an all-inclusive trip. It includes the hotel as well. 
and it includes all uh, transportation, the food, everything is included in the price that you pay. So all you need to do is arrive at Delhi airport on a certain day and we'll have somebody to pick you up at the airport. And as soon as you step out of the airport, everything is taken care of for you. So there are two options available. One is you can take up a single occupancy in, in the hotel room. And the other option is you can share a room with someone, you know, and take up double occupancy. So in case if you want to do single occupancy, the price until January 31st is $5,500. And for double occupancy, it's $5,000. And okay. so the prices go up $500 after January 31st. Well, that's awesome. I love that you have both options. I love that you have the training beforehand and during. You've got the mentorship going on. You've got some travel going on and you're just taking care of it. So they don't have to worry about meals. They don't have to worry about transportation. They don't have to worry about hotel. They just get to be there and be on the trip and have a lot of fun. Now, some people who come and do their own factory tours, I'm guessing that they're paying for that stuff on their own though, right? If they're wanting to do stuff outside of the trip, right? Yes, yes. If they want to do stuff outside of the trip. I mean, some people um, also stayed back um, a couple of days after the trip and they you know, did some more sightseeing and uh, visited more factories. So that's totally, um, yeah, that's, their, that's optional. And of course we can help them with hotel booking and also book cars for them if they want to visit other cities outside of Delhi. Um, but yeah, during the trip, which is the dates for the trip are April 13th to the 20th. Those are the dates. So it's an eight day trip, seven nights, eight days. Okay, 13th through the 20th. So you're just yeah. starting before um, phase two of the Canton phase Fair. Two. So I can just right. roll through India on my way. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, absolutely. In fact, some people did that <laughs> the last time. <laughs> so they started with India and then they went to Canton Fair phase two. And then they came back to Hong Kong for Global Sources phase <laughs> Three, which is the lifestyle and fashion show. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, that's fun. See, you guys, we could do a world tour. We could do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> so everybody, you heard it here first. You got to go to indiasourcingtrip.com. You need to book your trip before my birthday, which is January 31st, so that you can save $500 and then you can send me a nice birthday gift. So, yeah. you know, I'm just, that's my challenge for you. Uh, <laughs> it would be really great. Um, I'm sure, you know, I saw all of your, uh, your after the trip, everybody who went to, they had a wonderful time and they learned so much and it was just a great experience. So check out India, you guys, there's no better way to do it. You know, we're doing this thing. We're doing this Amazon thing. We, we may as well go to go to India and, you know, and source some stuff. So it'll be fun. Well, thank you so much, Megla, for teaching us about India and for offering us this amazing discount. And I hope to A, see you in India and B, I hope you see some of our seller roundtable listeners there too. Thank you again. That would be awesome. Here. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy, for having me. And yeah, it would be great if you could join us in India, you know, maybe in April or October, we do this twice a year. That'd be <laughs> <Hey>. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we will see you in India. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for live Q&A and bonus content after the recording at sellerroundtable.com. Sponsored by the ultimate software tool for Amazon sales and growth, SellerSEO.com and AmazingAtHome.com.